Hey, welcome back to Bridal Sewing Techniques, and today we're going to talk about how to cut the hem of a giant ball gown. Oh, but wait, before you pick up the scissors, let's go over some setup things, okay? They're really going to help. This is my basic cutting table setup. Uh, I did just kind of reconfigure it because my other one was getting a little wobbly. So there's some changes that I still need to make. I do want to put a floor kind of on the bottom of it there. But you can see how it is on casters. It's actually two folding tables that are kind of drilled down um, into those end boards. So it breaks down very easily if I need the whole room for some reason. I love that I can spin this thing around and have it positioned near all of my tools or whichever shelves I need to have handy at the time. To kind of anchor the dress so that I can work with it, I do have a ribbon uh, tied to the bottom of the table and it flips up over the top with an S hook on it. Never mind the tape, that's not doing anything. It's literally just keeping us from accidentally flinging the ribbon off the end of the table and having to fish it out. The whole point of all of this setup though, is to be able to lay the gown on its side where I can align the side seams of the skirt to begin hemming. So you're gonna see that's the heart of everything that we do here. Now, when you are hemming a large ball gown, uh, you can hem it with the crinoline in it, which is what I'm gonna do and kind of shove it out of the way. But if you find that the crinoline is way too large for you to even be able to mirror pin the hem, and I'm getting ready to show you what that means, uh, then in that case, you can always uh, push the crinoline up through the top of the gown to get it out of the way. So you're just going to kind of turn the crinoline part in wrong side out and still hook the dress in and then just work with the outer skirt layers to hem first. Like I said, I am going to hem this one with the crinlin included. That's actually how I hem most of the time. I'm going to start with kind of peeling away the outer layers like an onion. And then I am now kind of fishing out the spot where I've marked the hem with a pin. So uh, when the bride was standing in the gown, I put the pin to mark the floor. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through layer by layer and replace where the pin is grabbing that layer with a safety pin so that I can go ahead and let these layers move independently once again. It just saves me time at the pinning so I don't have to pin each layer while the bride stands in it. I can transfer the pins in the back room. To cut the lining layer, uh, you can keep the gown laying on its side, but a lot of times I'll just lay it flatly on its back to begin with. Um, and I'm just going to kind of pull this netting down, pull down the lining, get everything nice and straight in there. Then I'm going to start cutting on that lining layer. For this lining, we are just shortening it about four inches. It's not... Uh, particularly important to get the lining precise down to say like an eighth of an inch or, or something like, like the outer layer would be. So I'm just usually going to go ahead and eyeball that pin and say, okay, this is about four inches and I'll cut that off of it all the way around the lining layer. I make a really quick work of this because usually the edge of it is going to be surged or rolled hemmed anyways. So there will be some neatening up just by the way that we finish the edge. You can save lots of time on the lining layer. Do not agonize over this layer. It is the same exact scenario for me for trimming the crinoline layers or the petticoat layers, depending on how you say it. I always happen to call this crinoline, but I'm just going to zip right through this and cut off uh, roughly, it looks like this layer is more like a five inch. Uh, you, you're going to see some variation in how much you have to cut off of each layer. It's kind of funny how that works. But just because it appears that by measurement the bride should need a four inch hem, that does not mean every layer is going to be cut four inches. You certainly also do not want the crinoline layer to be scratching her feet or her skin in any way. 
So uh, it looks like here, I would say I was probably doing more like five inches in the front, about four inches in the back. When it comes to crinoline layers, you can, if it is a, you can see where I'm tapering up to make it a little bit shorter there. If it is a higher paying job, they want higher quality, higher cost, you can go back through and cover over this edge just as the crinoline was originally sewn. Most of my brides do not pay for that. They're happy to have raw edge. There's plenty of gowns that are very high-end gowns, very expensive gowns uh, that I have seen that have the raw edge crinoline. So uh, there's no particular, particular right or wrong way with that. You just want to be fair with what they are paying, whether or not you uh, restore the edge if it was originally bound. Personally, I think it would be unfair if it was a lower budget bride who did not have a lot of spare money uh, for me to assume that I should go ahead and bind this edge. So just to be clear, I do not mark where I'm going to cut all the way around on the edges of the crinoline or the lining layer. It does not have to be that exact. I have been sewing for over 25 years and I can pretty much track a four or five, six inch cut, two inch, whatever it is. I can pretty much track that when I'm cutting and cut it relatively level. When I was starting out, I probably did have to take a gauge to it and maybe put some pins or clips along the way to kind of help guide me. So just do this uh, wherever you're at. Uh, with your experience level, your comfort level, whatever can give your customer a straight hem. That's what really matters at the end of the day. I just like to encourage professional sewists who have plenty of experience to cut straight to go ahead and do some things to save time on these inner levels that do not quite matter as much in terms of the precision of the length, okay? Okay. I know that's probably going to get misquoted in the comments and somebody's going to come for me on that. But um, definitely, I think there's a lot to be said when you're a professional seamster. You need to know the difference between what really, really matters in terms of what will be seen and what you can save time on. That does not mean you're just gonna be a hack and whack and you know do damage to the gown inside and things like that. You don't want to go that far with it, but there is a difference in the amount of time that you need to spend on each layer in terms of the detail. Now we are at the point where we are going to cut some of the outermost layers. Basically, I have kind of pushed the crinoline to the left toward the train section, and I'm now aligning the side seams of the satin layer. I'm going to pin them together so that they cannot uh, move independent of one another. I'm going to keep all of the layers nice and neat and definitely in an orderly way where the seams are aligned at the side seams. That is going to be your most critical point. You can see that tailor's tack that is loosely attaching all of the side seams together. Most of the gowns come with this from the manufacturer. I'm going to give that a snip so that I can separate those fluffy sheer layers from the satin layer uh, because a lot of times when we're hemming if we hem a little bit on the sides uh, the the dress is joined together and the hem is going to be a little bit higher than where that tack is so where do we hem i'm going to talk about that a little bit while you watch me uh, get this situated I get asked that a lot. A lot of my clients ask me, and then also so as who are starting out ask me that. So the answer is, of course, we always hem center front. We usually hem at least half of the hem length off of the side seams. So let's say we're hemming six inches off in the front. We usually 
uh, we'll hem six inches off until right before the side seams, and then we start tapering, and we'll only hem about three inches off of the side seams, and then we continue the taper behind the side seams. That is probably what 80, 85% of my brides is, they're, they're going to pick that type of shape to their hem. For this reason, you see me now stabilizing the hem behind the side seams on this satin. And this is that mirror pinning that I was talking about for the mirror cutting. So I'm going to take pins and I'm going to pin the hem edge together all the way across. Now, is every hem perfectly straight from the manufacturer? No, <laughs> definitely a great big no. And uh, I'd say it's pretty common actually to see them not align perfectly. So you just kind of want to give it a tug and uh, try to make sure your fabric layers are straight before you pin that edge together. I do have one more pin here uh, marking the length in the front. And I'm going to show you in detail now because I kind of fudged over it earlier how I'm going to separate those layers. So there's a safety pin in the satin layer now. And I'm going to lift out the one that was joining all of them and I'm going to put that just through the organza layer now. So you can see where I can get the edge joined together. And then I'm going to go back through and I'm going to pin the satin layers together more in the vicinity of where the dress needs to be cut. Now, if there's a lot of thick crinoline and I feel like the dress is fighting me a little bit, I will go through sometimes and pin maybe several inches above where I'm going to cut, pin that mirror fold across so that everything is stabilized, super, super safe. And I know that the crinoline is not going to make a surprise appearance between these satin layers. This dress is being fairly agreeable though. So I'm not having to pin up super high, but I'm gonna go through and mark with my pins where I'm going to cut on the mirror. And I am tracking my length. You know, before I was saying I was just gonna track it kind of with my mind's eye. Now I'm taking that center front pin and I'm folding it back and making sure it aligns with each of my hemming pins. This way I'm not having to use a gauge uh, or a ruler or something like that, a piece of cardstock that I've marked for the hem length that's going to be cut off. I'm not having to do any of that to know that I have this mark right. If you guys have any questions in the comments, please leave them below. I do try to be very active in the comments on here. So if anything is unclear, just give me a holler down there. Ah, now you can see where I'm pinning a little high just to make sure that side seam stays perfectly aligned. And that's gonna help you get a nice straight hem as well. So why are we cutting on a mirror? Um, it does cut your cutting time in half, but we're not really doing it to save time. Uh, it does certainly save you time with pinning, definitely gives you a lot more accuracy. So there's a little bit of that. But the main thing is we want the hem to be a perfect mirror. Now, in some instances, you are dealing with scoliosis or different leg lengths in the bride. And in that case, sometimes on one side, you're hemming off only, say, two inches. And the other side, you're hemming off more like three or four. In that case, you do need to go ahead um, with a gauge and, and get that perfectly level to the floor for that bride and not do a mirror pinning. Now it is time to cut. As you have seen this whole time, I do like to keep my pins, for the most part, I like to keep my pins marking the floor for the bride. So that means when I'm cutting this, I'm cutting a little below the pin, you can see right there, to include my hemming allowance. So this is gonna be a rolled hem on not a super thick satin, but it's thick enough where I'm gonna need at least three quarters of an inch to an inch to make that hem. Now, what I just gestured to 
is I'm running my hand along behind the satin. Make sure you don't trim your fingers, of course. But I'm running my hand behind the satin to make sure I'm not inadvertently picking up any other fabrics. Bridal fabrics can get a little staticky. I do keep a little spray bottle to mist the dress down with water every now and then as needed, but I do keep my hands behind it to make sure I don't cut anything by accident. Oh no, guys, I thought I was recording, but I must have hit the button wrong. So I missed cutting this tapered piece off. So I'm just gonna kind of reenact it, but you can see we just kind of taper that angle from the last pin that we have at the side seam uh, to however far it needs to go to be a nice smooth taper. It's different for every gown. Here is a sketch of kind of the way I tapered it. So we did the full hem in the front, about a half hem at the side seam, and then tapered real quick. Now, I do get asked this a lot. How do you know how much to hem for each bride? It is different for each bride. Sometimes you'll get an outlier where you'll have a bride. Okay, so gowns are typically made for like 5'10", okay, mass manufactured bridal gowns usually are made for a bride the height of 5'10". So let's say you get a 5'2 or a 5'3, which is pretty petite for a wedding gown. Uh, you may have an unusual situation where that petite bride wants to keep all of the side flare. That's all the length at her side seams. But for the most part, okay, I'm going to make some generalizations here just for those of you who are trying to kind of find the handle on the cup. For the most part, when I have a petite bride, she wants what we call a footprint reduction where we kind of shorten the side seams a little closer to floor length. And then we take a long taper into the train. And that's what you see the leftmost part of this diagram. The moderate hem is the one that you just saw, okay? So if it's a 5'10 dress, and let's say the bride with her shoes and all, she's 5'7", something like that. Uh, that's when she's only gonna want maybe half a hem at the side seam and then a quick little taper. Nothing that, you know, kind of bursts out real fast after the side seam, but a nice smooth taper. Then on the far right, you see the tall. Uh, a lot of times when you have a tall girl, either... Uh, if she's truly tall, of course, the 5'10 or taller compared to the dress, then she's not going to need a hem. But I'm just saying on the side of tall, but still under the 5'10, she's usually only going to want just that little bit of a nibble off of the front of her dress so that she can walk safely. And they usually retain their full side flare. So uh, that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear the petite brides and the tall brides will both be a little more emotionally invested in the length of their side flare than what you hear from an average height bride. You'll hear really often, I'll hear a petite bride say, my clothes are always too long. I want my dress to look tailored for once in my life, for crying out loud, you know? And then my tall brides will say the exact same thing. All of my dresses have always been too short. Please don't cut my dress too short. I don't want my shoes to show. They'll be very emotionally invested in it and tell you prom, hymn length horror stories, that kind of thing. Uh, but this is just a general idea for you to look at of what you'll typically see. And then you just have this conversation with the bride to figure out exactly how you're going to taper. Onward and upward, guys. Uh, so now we are doing the organza layer. Some of you call it organza. Some of you call it organza. The world is not coming to an end over the pronunciation of this word. I call it organza. Uh, Repeat after me, never trust organza, <laughs> okay? You cannot turn your back on organza. I'm doing the same pinning that you saw me do with the satin layer, yes, but if I did not have a fairly opaque couple of layers over this organza, um, or at least layers that kind of accumulate to be opaque enough, and this organza was either the second layer under something very sheer or the top layer, I would not be cutting this on my table. 
Organza is shifty. Oh my, she's shifty. So you really, a lot of times I have found, I can't just pin and cut Organza and it be a top layer that super, super matters, okay? We're talking, it's got to be perfect down to an eighth or a 30 seconds of an inch or something. Um, I can't just cut that on the table and get it perfectly straight to my liking. The fabric pulls, it flows different. It's just, it's so open and shifty uh, that I would normally, if it was on one of the outermost layers, I would cut an organza hem while the bride stands in it. Now, what does that mean? That means I'm going to have her stand on a block that is going to be um, taller than my hem allowance. So it's going to have to be like an inch to an inch and a half that she'll stand on, and I'll cut the the skirt layer to the floor. So if there's another layer on top of it that's really sheer, I'll have her hold that up out of the way, look straight ahead, make sure her holding that up is not jerking up the under layers, and I will you know, get down on my hands and knees, and I will cut that layer level to the floor. That just takes experience. That's nothing I can teach you. Um, if you haven't gotten good at that yet, you need to drape some fabric um, or get some, you know, gowns at the Goodwill or something like that and throw them on a mannequin or throw them on, you know, somebody who's willing to help you learn, another seamstress or friend or whatever. Throw them on there and you need to practice cutting to the floor. That's all I can say. You want to cut it level to the floor. In this case, since it is buried, I'm going to go ahead and cut it mirror style just like we did the other one. Here in the meantime, you see me doing the same thing that I did to the satin layer. I am pinning it along the edge. I'm pinning kind of generally where I'm going to be cutting, uh, keeping all the layers nice and flat together. You can see how they're not, you know, bubbling up or acting any ways different. This organza is behaving very well for being organza. <laughs> but you can also see how I'm using that original pin as my gauge as I work my way across. This saves so much time. I will talk about gauges later on when I show you the other hemming technique for ball gowns. Uh, but right now, this is what I mostly do. I feel like it's a time saver. It's very, very accurate. There's not really much room for error uh, that I can see. So I'm happy with doing it this way. And now we're going to cut. Time to cut, guys. Uh, we're going to do this very similar to the way that we did the satin. I'm going to drop below the pins just enough for my hem allowance. Uh, repetition is your friend when it comes to this kind of work. It's going to reduce the chances that you'll make a mistake. You're going to save time because you're not going to have to reinvent the wheel all the time. But it also helps to build muscle memory, which that's kind of what makes you look like a horse whisperer. <laughs> you know, people will call somebody a horse whisperer. It's just whatever they're working with goes along with it. And you're going to start to see that as you develop muscle memory as a seamster, all of a sudden people are going to be like, oh my goodness, it's like magic. The fabric is doing whatever you tell it to do, whatever. It's not magic. You're not a horse whisperer. <laughs> oh, here comes the taper. I, I recorded this one right. You get to see me taper. So you can see how it's just a really natural progression here. But anyways, yeah, so you, you develop that muscle memory and things are just going to flow better. And, and that's the thing that people recognize where they're like, wow, this person is a pro. It's, it's how the baker, it just seems like, you know, when they're baking bread, the dough just folds the right way. It's not clumsy. It's the same way with fabric. And you can get there, I promise, with repetition. Zoe Hong always says, it's practice, not magic. She's an awesome YouTube instructor, by the way, guys. If you have not subscribed to her, you're not even breathing. <laughs> okay, so here's my bin I want to show you. It's just an extra large trash can. I don't even put a liner in it. 
um, because we don't put trash in here. But this is where I put all of my hem allowances and scraps. Uh, sometimes you have to revisit those, right? So um, I throw all of them in there. And before we throw it out, we'll kind of dig through. And if there's something that I find that I could really use as a scrap, we go ahead and pull it out, fold it up neatly, and put it with hem scraps. And then the rest gets thrown away. Check your local area if you have um, any fabric recycling places. It's just awesome to be able to participate in that. Sadly, we do not have that in my area. Let's cut the tool layers. Now, the way that I cut tool, uh, again, it's not just always a straight prescribed way. What I will most commonly do uh, in instances such as this, where we have a couple layers of tool and then the outer layer is kind of um, like a Swiss dot, English net kind of thing, pond de spree, whatever you call it, uh, with the lace applique. What I'll typically do, since it has that outer layer, is I'll go ahead and cut these layers on the cutting table. Uh, but if I did not have that outer layer, what I would typically do is maybe cut the second inner layer of the tool on the cutting table, but then I would cut the outermost tool layer to the floor as the bride stands in it. And I would do that at the very end of the project when we know, um, okay, it's final adjustment fitting because it only takes five minutes to cut it while they're standing. Seriously, it's it's not it's not time consuming. It would be final adjustment fitting. I would know her weight is not going to fluctuate anymore. It's the final pickup. Uh, she has the exact shoes she's going to wear. Everything is established, okay? I would never cut that outer tool layer, you know, three or four months before the wedding. Anything can happen. I have seen so many scenarios. And, you know, brides will tell you, oh, we can cut it early. My weight has not fluctuated since sixth grade or whatever she says. You know, she could break her leg and... Um, her metabolism gets slowed way down and put on weight. She could develop a thyroid condition. She could get pregnant. I have seen all of these scenarios and they're completely out of their control. Um, she could get uh, bronchitis and have to go on prednisone and gain weight. There's, there's things that can happen that can cause a fluctuation. Uh, but in this case, since it's a couple layers deep, uh, what I'm doing is I'm putting the pins higher than uh, where I'm actually going to cut because it's going to need a lot more stabilizing because this is a fuller layer. So these pins are not marking where I'm going to cut. These pins are stabilizing both above and below where I'm going to cut. So it feels more like a flat area that I'm cutting. As I cut, and you can see now I'm cutting to the pin, I'm going to roll this fabric over that I'm cutting off, and I'm going to use that fabric as my gauge to cut. That way, I don't have to have three ro rows of pins. It's very, very accurate. Again, keep your fingers behind where you're working. You're going to quickly feel behind where you're working before you start cutting to make sure you're not picking up any other layers. And if you're dealing with static, definitely mist it down a little bit. But this is the way that I'm going to work all the way up to just before the side seams when I start my taper. And again, super accurate way of cutting. These two tool layers are not wanting to play well together for the taper. So I'm cutting the taper independently, but I'm still using the other piece kind of as my guide for cutting the second taper if that makes sense. So sometimes you have to do that. It's not a big deal. Then just go clean up your notches if you have any. Technically, you shouldn't if you're really kind of, you know, seating your blades in the right way, but we all make mistakes. So just check over your work for those notches not nachos. You can get nachos later. We're cutting out notches. Can you pay attention, please? <laughs>
Now let's do our final layer, yay! Okay, so the exact same drill, and of course I'm not going to go over in great detail just as I have for all the other layers. Uh, one thing I did want to mention with this layer is there are some, uh, there's like two front seams that, that we can also align when we cut this layer, so that's nice. Also, uh, we did remove some lace applique so that we could hem, so we remove it, hem it, and then we sew it back on, you know, in a higher spot. I have other videos about that, so I didn't want to get into that in that video, but you can see here how I am making sure that these seams align, not just the side seams, but these two front seams, and then we're going to go ahead and cut using the uh, front part of the hem as a gauge as we go along. After that, I'm getting ready to show you the second way that you can hem or cut a large ball gown. I personally am not crazy about cutting it that way, but a lot of people, uh, that's the only way that they cut large ball gowns. So at this point, of course, we're gonna take it off of the table and do whatever kind of finishing work that the gown calls for. Uh, to get this gown finished for the bride. So that's what we're at with this right now. So this next dress, uh, to hang it, uh, we're gonna need a rigging system. You can kind of see that. I have other videos that show that in great detail, but there's a chain system going across the room. And this room is really kind of handy for hemming gowns because it's 10 foot ceilings. Um, but you can work with a lower ceiling if you need to. A lot of people just use a stool uh, and roll around on a rolly stool. Now, these are wonder clips, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip each hem layer independently. I'm going to clip them up and out of the way. And then we're going to start with the lowest most layer, the lining, the innermost layer, I'm sorry, and uh, this time I'm going to show you, instead of kind of eyeballing it, I'm going to show you how to use this gauge. So uh, some of you may be very familiar, some of you maybe not, but the slider will mark the original hem, and then the tip of it is going to mark where your pin is. And you're going to use this all across the front instead of mirror cutting, which technically you could still do while hanging. Uh, but a lot of people uh, that, that cut while it's hanging will use the gauge all across the front and put the needles all across the front, the pins, and do their tapering and their cutting across while the dress is hanging. There are some advantages to this. One, obviously, it's a space saver. Oh, let me show you this. If your slider is moving too quickly and loosely, you can kind of squeeze the two sides of the roller to tighten that up. You want it to kind of stay in the place you put it in. Anyways, back to the advantages of this. It is a space saver. You don't have to have that huge cutting table. Also, uh, this does work well when you have a hem that needs to be a little higher or lower on one side just because of the stance of the bride. So I'm going to start with a taper that I'm just, you know, kind of eyeballing and I'm working my way up to the pin. Because this is a lining layer, it's just going to be surged. So I'm going to cut right to the pin. I don't need any hem allowance. I apologize for the autofocus going crazy here. It's a tough job for a camera to focus on ivory on ivory. I'm going to cut across here and same thing as with the other project you're going to go layer by layer doing the exact same thing mark it with a gauge cut and then of course in the end you're going to finish each layer as is called for if you found this video helpful please don't forget to hit subscribe and ding the bell i have lots of videos coming up on the regular also visit my website, bridalsewingtechniques.com, where you can learn about joining me for a retreat. You can shadow me and 
see all the things that go around in the background of a very busy bridal sewing shop. I also have a book for sale that is linked to on my website. You can get that. And it's really going to help you get started in your business of sewing. As always, I hope this has helped you. You guys have a beautiful day. Thanks for watching.